Good morning, this is Pauline. And Alison. And um, we're going to start with the Site for White News for Friday the 7th of February 2020. Tuesday, 11th of February. The swimming group are swimming at the Waterside Pool in Ride from 8pm till 8.45pm. The pool is closed to the public whilst the group swims. There are male and female volunteers to help you get in and out of the pool, as well as lifeguards to ensure your safety. To join the swimming group, please call Site for White first to notify us of your swimming ability. You need to register with the office at Millbrook House first to be able to swim with the group. Wednesday, 12th of February. The weekly coffee morning will be held at Millbrook House from 10am to 11.30am. There will also be our low vision drop-in between 10am and 11.30am. This is a weekly event to allow you to view and try the low vision equipment we have at Sight for White without the need for an appointment. On the first Wednesday of each month we are joined by representatives from the Macula Society. The book group will be meeting at Lord Louis Library between 2pm and 3pm. We discuss the last month's book over tea and coffee and hand out the book for the next month. The books are available on CD or USB. Please contact Laura Jasper on 522205 for more information or you can email members at iwsb.org.uk. Thursday the 13th of February. The Thursday Social Group are meeting at Millbrook House. The group meets from 10.30am till 2pm. Most Thursdays, with the help of volunteers, the group enjoy a number of activities, crosswords, catching up on news and trivia, knitting and crochet. They are currently making pom-poms for the rug. This very friendly, mixed group also love to chat and enjoy lunch together. Later in the afternoon, volunteers come in and read to the group on different topics. If you would like to join the group, then please contact the charity on 522205. Any other news? Stakeholder consultation meeting is being held on Tuesday the 11th of February, 10am to 1pm. Please note that Millbrook House will be closed until 2pm to enable all staff members to attend this important meeting. Touch Tours Joe Bresloff is a freelance artist educator who is very passionate about making arts and heritage venues accessible for everyone. She organises touch tours, which are friendly and informal opportunities for visually impaired people to have a hands-on experience, whenever possible, of some of the arts and heritage exhibitions and collections in both Southampton and Portsmouth. There will be a touch tour at Southampton City Art Gallery on Friday the 28th of February 2020 from 10.30am to 12.30pm. These events are both free, but places do need to be booked. To book a place, call Joe Bresloff on 0744 322 4341. Macula Society meeting in Southampton. The Macula Society holds a meeting for working age people who are living with a macular condition in the local area and our nearest one is in Southampton. The group meets at the Standing Order pub in Southampton and the next get-together is on Saturday the 15th of February from 11am to 1pm. Our trustee, Ruth, will be travelling over with her guide dog via the Red Jet and walking up to the venue, which is about a 10-minute walk. If anyone would like to join her, then please leave your details with Laura on 522205 and then she will get in touch to arrange a time to meet at the Red Jet Terminal in Cowes. Please be aware that Sight for White is not organising this event and therefore no sighted guide support will be provided. Pre-owned equipment for sale. We have been asked to advertise on behalf of a member a pre-loved Braille Pen 12 Touch. This is a Bluetooth Braille keyboard with Braille display designed for use by individuals who are blind or have low vision. This keyboard connects to a phone, netbook, PC or tablet. It allows the user to navigate an external device with a joystick, write SMS, browse the internet, complete six key entry into a Braille translator or simply type. 
the user can also switch between 6 dot and 8 dot braille entries. The asking price is £100. If you are interested in purchasing this item or require more information, please call 01983 522205 and ask for Laura. RNIB Living with Sight Loss course. Have you or a family member been diagnosed with sight loss? Share experiences with others in similar situations and find out about services available to you. These free informal community-based courses provide information, advice, support and practical solutions for people with sight loss and those close to them helping them to adjust to a sight loss condition, increase independence and boost confidence. This course will be running on Thursday the 13th of February and Thursday the 20th of February, 10am to 3pm at Falcon Cross Hall, Shanklin, PO 37 7LA. To book your place, please call the RNIB on 0300 or you can email at I W S L E N Q U I R I E S at rnib.org.uk. More information can be found at www.rnib.org.uk forward slash living with sight loss. Accessible Activities and Services Day will be held at West White Sports and Community Centre on Saturday, March the 14th. 10.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. All welcome. Admission free of charge. For further details, phone 01983 752168 or email info at westwhite.org.uk This week's In Touch. Red button reprieve and working overseas when you're blind. The BBC is pausing its plan to shut down the red button text service after protests from blind users. But can it be saved long term? How safe are blind children as they go online? And the opportunities on offer for blind 18 to 35 year olds to volunteer to work abroad. Presenter Peter White, producer Mike Young. And now we go to the items from the um, county press for this week. A man who was crushed to death in a horrific tree felling accident could not be flown to the mainland for emergency treatment because the hinge on the air ambulance door was broken. Paul Whitehouse, who suffered fatal chest injuries when a tree fell on top of him, was instead taken to St Mary's Hospital by road. Mr Whitehouse's family has paid tribute to him after an inquest into his death was opened on Tuesday. The 42-year-old was working in Woodland, owned by his family, at Castlehaven Lane, Knighton, on January the 20th when the accident happened. The Hampshire and Isle of Wight Air Ambulance attended, but was unable to take off due to a fault with the door. A spokesperson for the Air Ambulance said, The safety of our patients and crew is of paramount importance, and we will never risk this by flying when it is not safe to do so. On this occasion, as is as is often the case, specialist critical care paramedics and doctors from the Air Ambulance Critical Care team administered emergency pre-hospital care at the scene before accompanying the patient to St Mary's Hospital by road. We are deeply saddened to hear of Mr Whitehouse's death and our thoughts and condolences go out to his friends and family. Mr Whitehouse's parents Joy and Alan Whitehouse said, we are devastated by the tragic death of our son Paul at the wood that he loved. We'd like to thank all those that tried to save Paul at the scene of the accident. The empathy and support provided to us by family friends, the Hurricanes and Ventnor Rugby Clubs and the general night and community has been of great comfort. Paul, who had many friends, was a hard-working, self-motivated man and he'd be sorely missed by all who knew him. They said the woodland was being cleared and managed as a long-term conservation project remodelled from 90% sycamore to a diverse mix of native trees, shrubs, bulbs and wildflowers. Mr Whitehouse of Queen's Road Freshwater leaves his parents, his grandmother Brenda, sister Claire, Uncle John and their families. He was described at the Isle of Wight Coroner's Court as a construction worker and forester. Coroner Caroline Summary, who adjourned the inquest on May 20th, said he was a ground person picking up wood and debris. A large piece of tree came down and landed on top of him. 
The cause of death was chest injuries. MP asks for more NHS funding. Mr Bob Seeley has asked for more money for the Isle of Wight NHS. Speaking in the House of Commons last Monday, during a debate on the government's NHS funding bill, he reminded Health Secretary Matt Hancock of the additional costs of providing health care at the same standard as on the mainland, calculated to be £11 million a year. He said there are many academic studies that show the costs of providing public services are greater, specifically on islands, because there is severance by sea. Basically, it means that on the island we have a district general hospital, but only half the population base of district general hospitals, so we do not get the same tariffs. As a result, everything costs more. It is very difficult to get the same efficiencies and economies of scale. It would be great to meet to discuss that. Following a successful trial, the Northwood House Charitable Trust has agreed to provide four free spaces a day for patients travelling to the mainland for NHS treatments or appointments. The Park Road car park is just a five minute walk from the Red Jet Terminal. Any parking bay may be used providing a permit is displayed. Permits may be obtained from Cowles Town Council. No bus cuts, says Southern Vectis boss. Rumours a rural bus service would be cut, tweeted by MP Bob Seeley, have been denied by the boss of Southern Vectis. At a meeting of the Isle of Wight Association of Local Councils, Bryston Parish Councillor John Chironi asked if it was true the Southern Vectis Route 12 service would be reduced. The service currently runs six times a day through the village. Tweeting earlier this month, Mr Seeley said he had written to Southern Vectis, questioning the decision to reduce the level of service on the route. Councillor Chironi warned reducing rural bus services would kill island villages and called on the Isle of Wight Council to take action. Other town and parish councillors from across the island echoed Councillor Tironi's concerns. They also had heard rumours about other routes being reduced and feared a lack of buses would isolate rural communities. Southern Vectis General Manager Richard Tildesley rubbished the rumours. He said, Can I just point out we are not reducing bus services on the Isle of Wight? I do not know where that came from. We improved the service last year, so there is no reason to get rid of it. The island's night shelter will be open for another year and its services expanded to help more homeless people. The Isle of Wight Council has secured a £288,000 grant from the government's Rough Sleeping Initiative to invest in the shelter at the former Barton Primary School in Newport. Around £50,000 will be used to transform the shelter, which provides rough sleepers with a warm, safe place to stay, into an assessment hub, with 15 emergency beds for people without a roof over their head. The Council will expand its housing's first project with charity Two Saints and fund a health and criminal justice navigator who will work alongside health and criminal justice services to reduce homelessness. Jamie Brenchley, the Council Service Manager for Housing Needs and Homelessness, said, I'm really pleased that, for the second year running, we've been successful in securing extra government funding to support us to achieve our aspirations to end the need to sleep rough on the island. We've made tremendous progress over the last 12 months, reducing rough sleeping on the island by 79%. This would not have been achieved without the collaboration and support from our partners. Homelessness is everyone's business and we are now starting to see the impact of services across the system coming together around individuals to help make change possible. There's still a long way to go, but this funding combined with the expertise we have available is starting to help us move towards our vision that everyone living on the island has a place they can call home. Since opening last November, the Winter Night Shelter has supported 34 rough sleepers to get them off the streets. Of those, 14 have been assisted in sustainable long-term accommodation. The shelter was due to close in March, but thanks to this week's funding announcement, will remain open for a further 12 months. A Totland woman walking her dog was horrified to see more than two dozen birds tied together in pairs dumped in the sea. 
Shelley Cook was walking Cookie along the beach from Totland Pier to Colwell. She said, At first I just saw two birds tied together in the sea. They were obviously dead and I thought they must have got tangled together and drowned. Then as I worked, walked further along the beach, I saw more and more pairs floating in the water. I counted at least 12 pairs, but I could see lots of other shapes out in the water. It was really distressing. I looked up what I thought I had seen online, and judging by the colour and size, I think they were pheasants. I don't know if they were dumped after some sort of shoot, but it was terrible to see. Shelley posted some of her pictures on the West White Wild Facebook page. County Press reader Karen Arnold said on Facebook, Shot pheasants are tied together in a brace, two birds, by the organised shoots. They could have been chucked or fallen overboard by mainland guns. People who've paid for a day's pheasant shooting, coming over for the day. The Society recently displayed a tree at the Bryston Christmas Tree Festival, which raised a record-breaking £14,100 for charity. The 23rd annual event saw around 250 themed trees displayed at venues in and around the village during December. Organiser Chris Goodman said our team worked so well with everyone putting their heart and soul into it and our commercial friends again lent wonderful support. Since the festival was funded in 1997 it has raised £145,966. National Ambitions for Island Company Coffee roasted right here on the island could soon be supped around the country. The Island Tea and Coffee Company has been awarded SALSA Salsa Safe and Local Supplier Approval Accreditation for its coffee beans, which are freshly roasted in Rookley. Salsa accreditation is aimed at small producers looking to supply national buyers on a local or regional level. Already in Morrison's stores in Hampshire, the certification will enable the company's coffee beans to be stocked in other supermarkets nationwide. Managing Director John Carter said, Receiving salsa approval is a great way to start 2020. We saw growth and success in 2019, and now this accreditation allows our outstanding coffee beans to be stocked on supermarket shelves across the whole of the UK. It demonstrates to our customers they are purchasing not just the freshest, but the best freshly roasted coffee. Credit goes to our master roaster, Mike Townsend, and our sales specialist, Wayne Upton, who have worked hard to achieve this highly prized seal of approval. They oversee every roast to ensure each bean is roasted to perfection and work with businesses to offer a bespoke service of the highest quality. We look forward to creating even more specialist coffee blends and look forward to promoting the Isle of Wight and its artisans. The Island Tea and Coffee Company was founded 35 years ago. The company also makes Carrie's Brook Tea and supplies more than 1,600 cafes, restaurants, hotels and other businesses. An island school cook has reached the final of a National Chef of the Year competition. Wendy Lose, 40, from Yarmouth, will join 11 other finalists at the LACA School Chef of the Year event after finishing as runner-up at the South East Regional Final. The final will be held in Stratford-upon-Avon. Each contestant had 90 minutes to prepare a main course and a dessert suitable for 11-year-olds. Wendy, who works for Caterlink, is a relief chef in primary schools and served up smoked five-spice pork stir fry with fresh egg noodles. It was followed by banana wonton served with blackberries, a cardamom chocolate dipping sauce and blackberry coulis. American Wendy has been cooking for more than 20 years, graduating from the San Francisco Culinary School. She previously worked at the city's Ritz-Carlton. She said, I moved to the island three and a half years ago because I had relatives here and wanted to slow down. I worked as a kitchen assistant at Shell Fleet School where my five-year-old son Croy attends but I had an itch to do more and the only position available was as a relief. I'm currently at All Saints Freshwater, but cooked my dishes at Binstead. Judges gave their feedback and I had to cook the same dishes in the regional final. There's a lot of pressure because while you're cooking, they talk to you a lot about your preparation and observe your skills. I'll have to cook the same two dishes again for the final. I can't change any of the ingredients, but I can change things like the presentation after the judges' comments. 
It's all very exciting and I'd also like to thank the schools for all their support. I'm very proud to be representing the island. The cooking competition is the flagship event for school chefs to showcase their professional skills. It has been organised annually for over two decades by LACA and is sponsored by McDougall's. Spotting the early signs of dementia. Isle of Wight GP surgeries have been urged to become dementia friendly practices to raise awareness about the early signs of the disease. The Islands Dementia Awareness Partnership has launched a campaign to train surgery staff to recognise the signs and has already carried out training sessions at East Cows Medical Centre. The charity's Barry Jackman said, GP surgeries are busy places and the only way to achieve a good early diagnosis is if the entire practice has some understanding of what dementia is. I am an islander and an East Cows resident so I've got a vested interest in making surgeries like this a part of our dementia friendly initiative. I hope the staff at the surgery will take away a wider knowledge of dementia. It is a disease for which there is no cure at present. Each person's journey is different and a speedy diagnosis enables people living with dementia and their carers to understand what is happening, what support is appropriate to their changing needs and where to find that support. It is essential for all staff to be able to spot the signs and to be aware of patients who have been diagnosed or may be showing early signs of the disease. We refer to this as being dementia detectives. East Cows GP Dr Sunitha Jinka said we want to be dementia friendly at the surgery. The sessions have been really well received and delivered some very important information. Our staff are the point of contact to help identify patients with dementia and help and support their carers. Signposting is the most important thing we can do. Barry has been very helpful and introduced us to the Isle of Wight Alzheimer's Cafe Network and the Dementia Steering Group. As a result of these sessions, we will be providing more information about dementia in our waiting room. We have already moved towards having a dementia group within the practice, led by our healthcare assistant. We want to continue to take things further to make our services even better. A task force has been set up to reduce bed blocking at St Mary's Hospital. The Isle of Wight Council's Health and Social Care Scrutiny Committee has set up a task and finish group to investigate delays in discharging people. Due to delays in discharging patients with social care needs during November, 8.3% of bed days were blocked by patients who did not need to be in hospital. The Isle of Wight NHS Trust carried out its own review shortly before Christmas. It found there was a lack of communication between staff, forms were incorrectly filled, filled in, and there was a lack of clarity over what medically fit meant. Committee Chair Councillor John Nicholson said, Obviously, it is not good for patients to be in hospital longer than needed. It is not good for the hospital as it blocks beds that could be used to treat other patients. Big dip for Ben. Braving the elements with a bracing dip in the sea was Sandown's way of paying tribute to Ben Boone, who recently died of heart complications at just 15. Around 100 people gathered near Sandown Pier and more than 30 rushed into the water for the fundraising Big Dip. The event was organised by Pebbles Cafe and Lulu's Tea Room and participants were encouraged to wear something with a Star Wars theme, Ben's favourite film. The money raised will go towards a headstone and memorial bench in memory of Ben. Ben's mum, Amber, said, I was totally overwhelmed with the amount of support on the day. It was absolutely amazing. The world's last seagoing paddle steamer, the Waverley, is set to return to the Isle of Wight in September. As report, reported, its boilers will be replaced following a successful £2.3 million appeal. Prior to the appeal, it was feared the Waverley may never sail again. The Waverley has now been moved from its winter berth at the Science Centre Glasgow to James Watt Dock, Greenock. Its two distinctive red, white and black funnels have been removed so work can begin on the boilers, which will take place over the next three months. Following sea trials, sailings will begin in the summer ahead of trips from Southampton, Portsmouth and Yarmouth to Swanage, 
Dorset and Weymouth in the autumn. Coronavirus advice issued. Island health bosses have issued advice on the coronavirus after two cases were confirmed in the UK. Chief Medical Officer for England, Professor Chris Whitty, last Friday confirmed two members of the same family had tested positive for the virus. They are the only confirmed cases after 416 people were tested. The Isle of Wight NHS Trust said the cases were in the north of England and those affected were being treated at a hospital in Newcastle. Public Health has ad England has advised anyone who has been in Wuhan, China, the centre of the outbreak, in the last three weeks to stay indoors and avoid all contact with other people. It has also advised them to call 111, especially if they develop any of the symptoms, which includes a cough, runny nose, sore throat, a fever and difficulty breathing. No cases of coronavirus have been identified on the island. Isle of Wight Council leader, Councillor Dave Stewart, said the authority was carefully monitoring the situation. He said, National government web pages are being regularly updated, so anyone who is looking for information should check there first. Our emergency planning teams are working with our health partners and I am confident we are well prepared should a situation develop on the island. British people have been evacuated from China and transferred to a quarantine facility in the Wirral area. The landmark bandstand on Ventnor Esplanade could be taken over by the Town Council for in confusion over who is responsible for maintaining it. Southern Water owns the pumping station, but it remains unclear whether it is also responsible for the public access viewpoint above it, which has been closed for years due to safety concerns. The Isle of Wight Council is similarly unsure and for months there has been no progress in getting to the bottom of the issue. The area used to be freely accessible to the public and was used by Ventnor Fringe as a popular alternative venue until recent years. Councillor Stuart Blackmore, Ventnor Mayor, said the Town Council met with the Isle of Wight Council last week to discuss taking it over. He said it is something we are quite concerned about because of the safety aspect, but there is no clarity over the ownership. It goes back to before the present administration at County Hall and we've looked at the land registry but to no avail. The Town Council is interesting in taking ownership of it, so watch this space. Hopefully we will get an answer pretty quickly. It needs maintenance and a new roof, but it's a, it is an asset for Ventnor and was always used an awful lot in the summer. It's become a landmark. We would not seek to develop it, but it would be nice to have more events and music there. The priority is to make it safe and take it from there. It would be most gratifying to see it in use again. Neighbour threatened to burn down houses. Another chance has been given to a freshwater man who caused a nuisance in his neighbourhood. David Hopkins, 59, of Sunset Close, was convicted of two counts of using threatening or abusive words or behaviour likely to cause harassment, alarm or distress on August 20th, 2019, when he appeared at the Isle of Wight Magistrates Court in December. He has now appeared at the Isle of Wight Crown Court for sentencing. The offences took place 12 days after he received a suspended sentence for battery and damaging property by throwing a smoke bomb into a neighbour's home and throwing a red liquid over the occupant. The court heard Hopkins had 25 convictions for 47 offences dating back to 1978. Prosecutor Jennifer Gray said the recent offences occurred when children aged 9 and 11 were playing football at a grassy area near Hopkins' home when he shouted abuse at them. He said he would burn their houses down and made vile and abusive threats. Their parents came over and were similarly threatened. Jonathan Underhill, defending, said his client accepted he was a nightmare when drunk and had a problem with alcohol abuse. Hopkins, a night porter at the Bugle, Yarmouth, and part-time carer for his partner, said he had sought the help of Inclusion and Alcoholics Anonymous and was disgusted and ashamed at his behaviour. Recorder Anna Midgley said it would be unjust to activate the suspended sentences as Hopkins' compliance with his community order had been good and she did not want to derail his progress. He was given a 12-month community order 
to include 150 hours of unpaid work and 10 further rehabilitation days. His suspended sentence was increased from 12 months to 24 months. He was also ordered to pay £80 cost and a £90 surcharge. A teenager with autism admitted stalking a 16-year-old girl he became obsessed with, sending her up to 2,000 messages and tracking her location on social media. Kyle Hill, 18, of Chestnut Close Ventnor, was sentenced at the Isle of Wight Magistrates Court after pleading guilty at an earlier hearing. The court heard Hill sent up to 2,000 messages to the girl and even turned up at her home after meeting her on Instagram. Prosecutor Anne Smout said, After the victim befriended Mr Hill online, he began to call her as often as 60 times a day. He turned up outside her address and was seen to be staring inside. On another occasion, he used the location sharing function on Snapchat to find out where she was. He admitted he had an obsession with the girl. Liz Miller, defending, said, Carl is not the typical kind of person who finds themselves in this, this kind of situation. He is prone to obsession, not just with people, but also with objects. In the past, his parents have sought to find help for him, but to no avail. He has no idea about how relationships work, and in a sense, he was trying to protect her. He's never bothered the court system at all before this incident. In terms of support, his mother and father will always be there to look after him. Magistrate sentenced Hill to a 12-month community order to include 20 rehabilitation activity days. A major environmental project to enhance the biodiversity of a dormant West White Quarry is underway. A restoration project is being undertaken by White Building Materials with the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust and Natural England at Prospect Quarry near Shalfleet. It aims to restore important habitats, such as limestone grassland, by controlling scrub and non-native species, such as Japanese knotweed, and introducing grazing. A site of special scientific interest, Triple SI, for its geological features, the quarry is one of the island's top spots for Bembridge limestone and of limestone grassland. Key to the project, funded through the Aggregate Industries Local Partnership Fund, will be the input of white building materials staff over the five-year project. Steve Burton, White Buildings Materials General Manager, said, We want to ensure the quarries we work are not only returned to nature, but enhanced too. Our staff will be at the heart of this work, and we will also be looking to involve the wider community as we restore and then manage this beautiful habitat. Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust ecologist Sarah Boswell said, The site displays many features usually associated with the chalk downland, such as rest harrow, cowslips, carline thistle, kidney vetch and the rare dwarf mouse ear. This project, working alongside a similar project we are undertaking with white building materials on St George's Down, is about ensuring the restoration maximises the ecological potential of these sites. Dinosaur bones that were dramatically revealed after 125 million years have once again been hidden after further cliff fall. Pictures of the Iguanodon tail vertebrae taken by Walker, Pippa Fairweather and published by the County Press last week went viral making national headlines and being shared on social media across the globe. However, when she revisited the site this week, between Grange, China and Isle of Wight Pearl, on the island's southwest coast, the bones were no longer visible. They'd been underneath an overhanging piece of cliff, which has now fallen away. Pippa said, we went to have another look, but it's all covered over now, maybe for another million years. Lovely jubbly. Only Fools and Horses star visits Ireland. Only Fools and Horses star David Jason has popped over to the Isle of Wight to film an episode for his new television show. Sir David, also famed for open all hours and a touch of frost, visited Hover Travel's ride terminal for the More 4 documentary series David Jason's Great British Inventions. Hover Travel's fleet captain Steve Attrell said, We were honoured to host an actor who has made so many of us laugh throughout his career, and his interest in our hovercraft came from an informed and genuine passion for British engineering. We arranged a special trip for Sir David so we could explain the technology which powers our craft, 
giving him and the viewers some insight into the current world of passenger hovercraft operations. Sir David and the film crew from Wise Owl Films visited Hover Travel last year to capture the actor meeting the pilots and engineers who keep the craft flying. He was also shown around one of the hovercraft and given a demonstration of his extreme manoeuvrability and marine capabilities. In the series, Sir David explores his favourite Great British inventions, including a Reliant Regal supervan, which evoked great memories. A missing 23-year-old from his cows has been found safe and well in the Costa del Sol, two months after he was reported missing. Harry Stagg disappeared on November the 29th on the way to his granddad's home in Malaga, where he was due to spend Christmas, sparking a national search by the Guardia Civil. The Olive Press, an English newspaper in Spain, said he had now been found with a big beard. He was unaware he'd been reported missing or that anyone was looking for him. He's been reunited with his aunt and uncle, Paula and Simon Morris, who live in Spain. Simon said, Harry seemed fine, he was a bit tired, but very talkative. He'd walked most of the way down the coast. A council tax rise, increased charges for garden waste collections and new parking fees are among the Isle of Wight Council's budget proposals for the forthcoming year. However, an additional £6 million has been earmarked for children's services. In papers released on Wednesday, the Conservative-led Council said it had managed to balance its books in the current year by clawing back a predicted £1.2 million overspend due to pressures in adult social care and children's services. However, to make the necessary £4.5 million savings in the 2020-2021 financial year, the Council said it will have to make further cuts generate more income and find efficiency savings. The budget is due to be approved by full council on February the 26th. Proposals include a 3.99% council tax rise equivalent to £1.09 a week for Band C household. 2% will go to adult social care. The cost of the Green Garden Waste Service will rise from £60 to £72, generating an extra £120,000. A saving of £321,000 in home to school transport by combining some routes. Fewer books will be bought for libraries, saving £15,000. A new annual 24-hour parking permit costing £600. Previous permits for up to eight hours cost up to £462. Pay and display charges will rise by an average of 20 pence per hour. Parking fees to be introduced at Cow's Seafront. An increase in fees for burials and cremations. A new £1 charge for 30 minutes parking in Newport High Street. Grounds maintenance will be reduced in parks and cemeteries. £1.7 million will be allocated to disabled facilities grants, helping people to remain in their homes. Council leader Dave Stewart said the proposed cuts equated to £300,000, just 7% of the budget, and there were no planned redundancies. He said the remainder of the £4.5 million would be made up in other ways. Finance Cabinet member, Councillor Stuart Hutchinson, said he had never known so many uncertainties following Brexit, ongoing island deal negotiations and a delay in the government's fair funding review, which the Council hopes will see an extra £2.5 million allocated to the island. Councillor Stuart said a Conservative Council, working with a Conservative MP and a Conservative government, would help the island secure the funding it needed. Councillor Hutchinson said more money was needed for adult social care due, due to the island's rapidly growing elderly population. He said, In every discussion that has taken place, we have been mindful of the impact of budget cuts. We have tried to find a balanced and fair way to do this, but of course there are areas where it has been tough. We feel this budget continues to give protection and support for the most vulnerable, and balances that need with ensuring we provide continued services for the hard-working taxpayers who fund what we do. 
Mental health services at the Isle of Wight NHS Trust have improved and waiting times have fallen, but staff morale remains low. The Care Quality Commission, CQC, has carried out a snap inspection to see what action had been taken since services were rated inadequate in September. In May, the CQC issued a warning notice after inspectors found the care provided was unsafe. Some people had waited for two years for mental health care and existing patients were not regularly contacted by staff to make sure they were coping. Following the latest inspection, the CQC's Head of Hospital Inspection, Karen Bennett-Wilson, said the Trust had worked hard to bring about substantial improvements to its community mental health services for adults. She said, while there is still further improvement needed, we considered the Trust had met the requirements of the warning notice. We will continue to monitor progress and will return to check further improvements have been made and are being sustained. The number of people waiting to be seen by the community team had been reduced from 180 in May to just 13. The average waiting time for psychological therapy had been reduced from two years to one, although some patients had still been waiting for two years. Two care pathways had been introduced for eating and mood disorders and more were being developed. Thanking staff for their hard work, Trust Director of Mental Health and Learning Disabilities, Dr Leslie Stevens said, it is positive news for our community that waiting lists and caseloads are reducing and the team is getting better at managing risk. We will continue to transform mental health services on the island and make a positive difference for our community. A resident evacuated from their home following the Belgrave Road collapse has been advised it is now safe to return. Pedestrian access has also been reinstated after the Isle of Wight Council said there had been no significant ground movement in recent days. As reported, the wall running alongside the Ventnor Road partially collapsed on January the 16th, causing the carriageway to crack open and earth to spill out from behind the wall. The Council said the road would remain closed to traffic for the foreseeable future and it will not take any action to fix the road until the situation has stabilised. Wire netting remains in place to catch falling debris. The Council said, while the upper wall has shown signs of minor movement, there has been no significant change to the overall terracing structure in recent days, nor any additional threat to properties in the affected areas. Island roads will maintain a presence at the site to monitor the situation and community liaison officers are supporting residents. Politician turned TV personality Michael Portillo opened the New Look Bar at Shanklin Theatre on Saturday. The former MP, known for his bright jackets, wore a fetching shade of salmon for the occasion, which preceded his sold-out show A Game of Two Halves. Welcomed by the Friends of Shanklin Theatre Chair Janet Wardle, Mr Portillo cut the ribbon and was introduced to the volunteer maintenance team led by Neil Reader, who carried out the refurbishment. The theatre's volunteer bar team also contributed to the upgrade. A bottle of red wine was presented to Mr Portillo after he met the theatre's managing director, David Cast, director Vic Farrow and Shanklin Theatre and Community Trust Chair, Chris, Chris Quirk. After his ministerial life and a spell as shadow councillor of the Exchequer, Mr Portillo found further fame in his series Great British Railway Journeys and further series in Europe, Asia and America. The modified car community will gather at Tesco in Ryde on Sunday to remember Michaela Logan, who died in a crash in Areton last month. The 19-year-old of Carisbrook Road, Newport, was driving a Ford Fiesta when she crashed at Hale Common, where a sea of floral tributes can now be seen at the roadside. Her brother, Tom Logan, and the White Modified Family Facebook group said, I know a lot of you will be looking for a way to say goodbye to M, and I guess it's our way as a car community to do that with a gathering. There will be fireworks and a collection for Michaela's favourite charity, White Brainy Bunch. Uh, ASDA Donation. ASDA has donated £500 to Site for White. The charity was chosen by customers at the Newport supermarket through its Green Token Scheme. The amount was double the usual donation in celebration of the ASDA Foundation's 30th birthday. 
A man found with almost 3,000 indecent images of children as young as six, who had also been trading images online, has escaped jail. Nigel Ghent, 49, of Market Street, Ventnor, who was arrested at his place of work, had searched for images tagged pre-teens and Lolita Angels and shared them with other offenders. He was given a suspended sentence at the Isle of Wight Crown Court last Thursday. He had pleaded guilty to seven counts, three of possessing indecent images of children, three of distributing indecent images and one of encouraging or assisting in an offence at an earlier hearing. Prosecutor Tim Compton said Ghent was caught after Metropolitan Police officers searched the computer of another f offender and discovered Skype messages sharing indecent images from an account belonging to him. They were able to track Ghent down by tracing his email address and discovered he had sent pictures and videos to others. Mr Compton said, on his laptop there was a folder titled Pics that was used to save the images. There was an ongoing conversation with an account named Desert Darren asking Mr Ghent such as things, how young do you want to see? An examination of Mr Ghent's laptop found almost 3,000 explicit images and videos of children aged between 6 and 14. His search history showed he had used Google to look for things such as pre-teens, Lolita Angels and Twinks. In interview he said he had done wrong and was sorry. He told police he just wanted to feel loved. The court heard Ghent had lost his job following his appearance at the magistrate's court and had no previous history of offending. Oscar Vincent, defending, said His attitude has been one of complete and utter acceptance. He has pleaded guilty and has not hidden from what he has done. Judge David Melville Selt said, Children of a very young age have been exploited for these images and for your own sexual gratification. One can only imagine the grief, distress and effects on these children in order to produce these images and one can only hope their suffering will not be lifelong. But one can only hope. Ghent was sentenced to two years in prison, suspended for two years. He was placed on the Sex Offenders Register for 10 years and ordered to complete 250 hours of unpaid work, including 40 rehabilitation activity days. And now it's goodbye from Pauline and from Alison. Hello, this is Sonara. And this is Imeldas, and we're reading the letters to begin with. I believe Maggie Olden and her Isle of Wight National Health Trust deputy earn huge salaries each year. Recently, I read about an elderly Isle of Wight dementia patients suffering because they had used up their allowance of incontinency pads. St Mary's catering facilities were allowed to deteriorate to a one-star rating. This week, I read about an 86-year-old man left lying in agony on a bitterly cold pavement waiting three hours for an ambulance. Am I alone in wondering just what the hell is going on? And that's from Joan Kingsley of St Helens. And this one is from Sue Lupton of Newport, entitled Heading Here. My son, Dr. Ben Ridley, a former Nine Acres Primary and Carisbrook High School student, is currently on work placement at a hospital in Kota Kumbalu in northern Borneo. He visited the Sabah Museum where he chanced on a reference to the Isle of Wight. I wondered if any county press readers recalled the visit. And more letters. This one comes from J. Gibbons of Ride. Like Cliff Bennett's letters, County Press of the 31st of January, I have noticed an apparent imbalance in the CP's political coverage, not helped by your front page of the same issue. This started with Rebecca Roncornoni's remarkable article after the general election. 
I don't generally save clippings, but I thought that worth preserving. If readers missed it, it is on the website and well worth reading. In the editor's reply to Cliff's letter, it said, We can't possibly publish letters we don't receive. But my comment on Printer's Inc, perhaps it was thought over the top. I and most readers assume you get hundreds of letters each week. Are we mistaken? My view, which I may have expressed too often, is that the reader's letter page is the best part of every newspaper, not what any editor wants to hear, perhaps. I think they used to be given more space, and I would like to see that again. Make Red Jets Bike Friendly from Naomi Highland of Binstead. On a recent trip on the Red Jet, I couldn't help but notice an altercation between the attendant and a cyclist. The cyclist had brought on his folding bike and placed it into the luggage rack, but hadn't quite fitted his IKEA bag around the bike fully. The attendant asked the cyclist to fit the bag properly, which he was well within his right to do. To comply with the Red Funnel's policy, a, a bike must be carried in a bag. <clears throat> but unfortunately, the manner in which the attendant asked was to myself and the cyclist seen as a slight assertion of power by the attendant, and as such the request did not go down well. Red Jet was initially designed to carry bikes, but during the build it was determined that the bike holding area should be turned to seating. Is this short-sightedness, or just greed, trium trumping sustainable travel? When travelling on White Link's Fast Cat, I'm always delighted to see that no matter what time of day it is, there are always plenty of bicycles. There is certainly a demand from both commuters and visitors to bring their bicycles on board. With the increasing need for the public to step away from their car and the 2021 Tour of Britain heading to the island, it's time Red Funnel turned their jet screen too. And now we go on to White Memories. And this week it's cows and the curious case of Captain Smith. True or false? The Titanic hit the iceberg because of events off Cow's Esplanade a few months before. The answer, believe it or not, is true. The Titanic had a sister ship, the 45,000 ton liner Olympic. She was the largest ship in the world and just 12 weeks old when she left Southampton docks on a wet September afternoon in 1911 on her fifth trip to New York. She was carrying 3,000 passengers and crew and according to the Times, among those on board were 20 millionaires whose total wealth is estimated at $500 million. As the millionaires sat down for lunch, the Olympic left Southampton water, steamed slowly to the west, rounded the Bramble Boy off Egypt Point, and then turned east towards Spithead. Despite the rain, large crowds had gathered along Cow's Esplanade and were watching the ship sail past the Royal Yacht Squadron when in the distance, approaching from the west, came HMS Hawk, a naval cruiser on its way to Portsmouth. Both ships were now going in the same direction. As the county press reported, the Hawk overtook the Olympic and appeared to attempt to pass it on the starboard side. And then, after getting above level, about level with the liner's foremost funnel, steered to port. This manoeuvre had a disastrous result for the cruiser, crashing into the Olympic some 50 feet from the liner's stern. On the bridge of the Hawk, it was panic stations. 
The subsequent inquest heard that as the hawk swung in towards the liner, the captain, William Blunt, called down the voice pipe to the helmsman. He said, What are you doing? Port, hard a port, full a stern starboard. At the same time, Captain Smith of the Olympic called out to the pilot who was navigating her through the Solent. He's starboarding, he said. He's going to hit us. The pilot ordered hard a port in an attempt to swing the liner's stern away from the cruiser. But by then it was far too late and the two ships collided. According to the county press, the terrific impact sounded like an explosion and was heard more than a mile away. For some minutes the two ships lay together. The cruiser's stern locked into the, link, into the liner's quarter. Then the hawk went astern and the terrific damage was visible. The plates of the liner were smashed, leaving a great gapping hole about 15 feet across at the widest part. The water-typed compartments of the Olympic had been promptly closed and although the ship made a good deal of water, there was no danger of her sinking. Naturally, the collision caused great alarm among the passengers, but the great many who were in the saloons and other parts of the ship were quite unaware that the ship had been rammed until informed by the crew. It was seen to take a decided list immediately after the impact. Both ships locked together, stopped their engines. Collision mats were put out and the watertight bulkhead was closed. The, house, the hawk's bell was buckled and twisted and was a pitiable sight. The plating was ripped open and torn away like paper. When the collision occurred, fragments of the bow were seen to fly off in all directions. Reports of the collision spread rapidly through cows and people flocked to the esplanade and seafront to view the badly damaged ship. The Olympic drifted like a ship out of control, almost to Osborne Bay. The Hawk made a good deal of water, but the bulkheads did their work and the cruiser was placed in the dock at Portsmouth Dockyard on Thursday morning. The crippled Olympic remained at anchor in Cowes Roads throughout the night, the pumps constantly at work, and got safely back to Southampton on Tuesday. To no one's great surprise, the naval inquiry cleared the hawk of all blame. The Olympic was declared to have sailed too close to the hawk, allowing its vast bulk to draw the hawk into its side by suction. It was a verdict that was not shared by many outside the Navy. The Olympic returned to the Belfast Yard of shipbuilders Harland and Wolfe, where, the, where she had been launched just 12 weeks before, and what she, when she got there, it was to find that her sister ship, the Titanic, then under construction, was almost ready for launching. After examining the Olympic, a decision was taken which would have far-reaching consequences. It was decided that work on the Titanic would be halted so repair to the Olympic could be carried out immediately allowing her to return to service. It was a decision that effectively sealed the Titanic's fate. The Olympic was repaired and as a direct result, the launch date of the Titanic was missed and she eventually left Southampton on her maiden voyage, not on March 20th as originally intended, but on April 10th. 1912, to keep her appointment with the iceberg four days later. There is one final eerie twist to the tale. Captain Smith also had an appointment with the iceberg. Following the Olympic accident, 
he was assigned to a new ship, the Titanic. Singularly unlucky, Captain Smith was at the helm of the Titanic as she struck the iceberg on her maiden voyage, and as she sank, she took Smith with her. Okay, we now go on to public information, and this is a letter from uh, Mr Bob Seeley, our MP. Brexit got done. Last Friday marked a significant step forward in our departure from the EU. January the 31st will be remembered as a momentous day in political history. I know this day was welcomed by many of you. For those who remain nervous about leaving the EU, rest assured this government is doing everything it can during this transition period to ensure our country maintains a close and advantageous relationship with our European friends, albeit one outside of EU membership. This year has seen a positive start in Westminster, not only with Brexit finally moving forward, but we're also seeing the government delivering on other promises it made in 2019. Police funding has been increased by 1.1 billion, which means recruitment for more police officers can start straight away. We've also heard military veterans will get cut price train travel with a new rail card on sale from Armistice Day. There will be many more positive announcements coming forward soon. In local news, I remain focused on the promises I made to you last year to keep fighting for the island to ensure it receives proper recognition from the government for its status as a UK island. This means more funding to allow the island to receive the same benefits that other UK islands enjoy and to stop the island being considered as part of the prosperous southeast region. I'm continuing my campaign against the government set housing targets in the island plan and I welcome invitation from areas of the island I haven't yet visited to raise awareness of my campaign against overdevelopment on the island. I urge all islanders to complete the Isle of Wight uh, to complete the Isle of Wight's housing needs survey, which will provide vital evidence to take to the government about what islanders actually need in terms of housing. The survey runs until February the 16th, so there's still time to complete it. I'm concerned about the survey and some of the assumptions in it, but I'm going to look at the detail before commenting next month. I also encourage you all to sign my petition against the housing targets. If you would like to get in touch or book an appointment to see me, please contact my office on 220220 two, or email me at mp at parliament.uk And moving on to my view, which this time is written by Malcolm Mime or Meme. School success stories earn praise from me. My column today has an ending that might surprise you, given I haven't always been particularly kind to our Conservative Isle of Wight Council administration. It's nearly three years since the Conservatives were elected to run the council, which means that they now have just 15 months left in office to accomplish the things they promised to do. One of the main promises made by leader Dave Stewart was that 25% of our schools would achieve an Ofsted rating of outstanding. It was quite a bold pledge, especially as David Pugh had also used education to get elected in 2009 with the promise that island schools would be in the top 10% nationally and was then humiliated at the election 
after our schools fell to the bottom of the national pile. In 2017, just 2-4% of the island's 52 schools were rated as outstanding. As long as the Isle of Wight College and Bembridge Primary could keep their outstanding status, Dave had four years to raise the rating of 11 good schools to outstanding. Back in 2018, I gave an interim report. The college had lost its outstanding status and no other schools had been upgraded to the top rating, so it wasn't looking promising for Dave and his pledge. Our MP Bob Seeley and Education Cabinet Minister member Councillor Paul Brading wrote letters to the CP complaining about me, with Councillor Brading st stating, I knew little of the substantial improvements this Conservative administration had made. So, so where are we now? Well, despite Councillor Brading's claims, the Conservatives had made substantial improvements. Bembridge Primary has lost its outstanding rating and the popular Yarmouth Primary is to be moved. There have been 11 Ofsted inspections since Councillor Brading's claim and only two schools have seen their rating improve. A layman or laywoman could be forgiven for thinking things are getting worse. But I believe the opposite is happening. I did say I might surprise you. Having read the Ofsted reports, I can see things are heading in the right direction. Those schools that have maintained their previous grade are continuing to make improvements, while the two schools that have improved their grade, uh, Dover Park and All Saints, are on course to go to the next level. Special praise should be given to the head teachers of those schools, Anita Wilcox and Nikki Mobley, who have worked hard to turn things around. It appears we now have a batch of really good head teachers. I congratulate Councillor Brading. He was right. I did know little of the substantial improvements being made, but my criticism has always been of the pledge made by Councillor Stewart to have 25% of schools rated outstanding, which was never going to happen. The pledge need never have been made, perhaps when or if he seeks re-election next year. Councillor Stewart will give it, to, give it to us straight. He'll earn far more respect that way. And now we come to what's on. And first of all, I've got Sing to Beat the Blues. A new support group for people has been launched, helping people tackle anxiety through singing. The Wellbeing Singing Group meets at St John's Church Ride at 11am on Wednesday morning. Singer Annalisa Vaughan, who runs the sessions with church warden David Rowe, said they were born out of increasing demand for support and delays in receiving professional support for anxiety and depression. The group which has around 30 members, meets for an hour every week to sing together and take part in deep breathing exercises. Annalisa said no singing ability was required as it was all about relaxing among friends. And for further information, you can go visit www.facebook.com projectopera P-R-O-J-E-C-T-O-P-E-R-A forward slash events or just drop by. And still with entertainments, Tilly's new play aims to highlight effects of inequality. Origins Theatre is gearing up for the premiere of a fast-moving, thought-provoking new play. Penned by island writer Tilly Windfold, 
the play Underneath Reflections tells the tale of people who have been given society's labels and explores whether it brings them together or tears them apart. Tilly, who has cerebral palsy, knows from bitter experience the difficulties people face, which inspired her to write the play and to show the world we deserve equality and all have situations to deal with. Underneath Reflections is being performed at Newport's Key Arts at 8pm on February 21st and 22nd. Tilly, with a passion for acting since she was aged six, has performed in, the th in theatres for 14 years. I decided to become an actress to show the world just because someone has a disability, it doesn't mean they're different on the inside to anybody else, she said, and she directed the play. Uh, congratulations to Tilly. And this is a diet tip for diabetics. The Diabetics Group Isle of Wight will hold an event at the Riverside Centre Newport on Thursday next week with information about following a low-carb diet. Dr Lorena Arnes, a diabetes and endocrinology consultant at St Mary's Hospital, will be the guest speaker. The event is free and takes place from 6pm to 8pm. To book a place, email info at diabetes dot no I start again email info at diabetes I -O -W dot org dot uk and still with entertainments Apollo to stage Ruth Ellis play next Friday we'll see Newport's Apollo Theatre embark upon a seven show run which promises to be an emotional roller coaster. The Thrill of Love, originally a book by award-winning writer Amanda Whittington, tells the story of Ruth Ellis, the last woman to be hanged in Britain in 1955. The play sheds new light on the events that unfolded in the build-up to her execution. The Thrill of Love, which combines the language of film noir with the unmistakable voice of Billie Holiday, the legendary jazz singer who was at the peak of her fame at the time, will be performed by the Apollo Players, the theatre's resident company, from next Friday, February the 14th. It will run then from the following Tuesday until February 22nd. And next there's Legends of Irish Music and Song. Hear them sing all their hits including Sweet Sixteen, I Will Love You, The Green Fields of France, Red Rose Cafe, The Old Man, Leaving Nancy, Learn to Hear, etc. This is the Furnace. They're going to be singing for you all on Friday the 28th of February at the Shanklin Theatre. And tickets can be bought on 01983 868 000 or you can go online to www.shanklintheatre.com. And next month promises to be entertaining. Medina Theatre has so much going on in March, it's hard to know where to start. If the winter months have left you in need of a laugh to lift your spirits, John Culshaw's The Great British Takeoff Show will be just the ticket. Comedian, impressionist and star of BBC Radio 4's Dead Ringers, John is accompanied on stage by comedy producer and author Bill Dare. Following sell-out runs at the Ed Edinburgh Festival, and across the UK, the pair will be at Medina on Friday, March the 6th. 
join them for an evening of unscripted, spontaneous comedy and conversation as politicians, sports personalities and celebrities are all up for a roasting. The Great British Takeoff is topical, satirical, anecdotal and highly entertaining and it's never the same show twice. Tickets are £20 and are available online or by calling the box office on 823-884. Fans of Barbara Dixon will be delighted to hear she is on tour with the talented Nick Holland. The pair intimately shape their music to suit the fact that only two people are on stage, sharing the space and filling it with superb crafted sound. This results in a mature mixture of sublime old and new songs. Catch her stunning show at Medina Theatre on Wednesday, March 11th at 7.30pm. All tickets are priced £30. Call 823-884 to book. Now this is just a little bit extra. Super Joe makes it four in a row. Joe Wade challenged up an unprecedented fourth consecutive ride 10-mile road race victory on Sunday. Among a record field, which saw 506 finishes, runners took on a challenging and hilly course around Ride, Seaview, St Helens and Nettleston. Joe, 31 of Ride and a member of Ride Harriers, completed the course in 55 minutes 12 seconds, 38 seconds slower than last year. But he still breezed home 2 minutes 24 seconds ahead of his nearest challenger, Stuart Holloway of Salisbury and District Athletic and Running Club. Gary Marshall, also of Ride Harriers, improved on his sixth place of last year to come third in 58.24. Something different. Banjo Bill makes a welcome return to the Isle of Wight. There have been a number of additions to the avifauna of the Isle of Wight in recent years as a result of environmental change, the latest being the spoonbill. This amazing looking bird is arriving in increasing numbers each year to overwinter at Newtown National Nature Reserve. In November, a flock of 12 arrived, a record for the island, and have remained in fluctuating numbers as they divide their time commuting across the Solent to the Key Haven area and making occasional visits to Yarmouth. The birds are thought to be part of the breeding population from the Netherlands, who have chosen the south coast of England as a result of the milder winters, instead of migrating to northwest Africa. Their plumage, white, apart from a yellow buff at the base of the neck and black tips to the wings of immature birds, and long legs, make them look heron-like. Yet they have this long, spoon-shaped bill which has a yellow tip in adults. Standing just under a metre tall with a 1.3 metre wingspan, spoonbills are between a little egret and a grey heron in size. There are no half measures with spoonbills. Either they are asleep for hours on end on one leg with their head and bill invisible among their back and wing feathers, or they are engaged in frantic feeding activity. This consists of a vigorous paddling movement of the feet, stirring up the sediment, while the bill is held slightly open and scythes through the shallows. When a larger item is found, there is a sudden upward jerk of the head, flicking the prey to the back of the mouth. Spoonbills had nested widely in southern England and part of Wales during the Middle Ages and acquired a number of interesting old names. Among them were Shoveler, later used for the duck with the shovel-shaped bill, 
Chollard, and my favourite, Banjo Bill. A mixture of persecution and habitat change resulted in their extinction in Britain around 1668. Happily, a dramatic increase in the Netherlands population in the 1990s resulted in a pair successfully breeding in Norfolk in 1998. And by 2018, this had risen to a colony at Holcomb of 28 breeding pairs. Perhaps one day they will become a breeding bird on the island. And now young athletes excel. Leading cross-country runners from Ireland schools competed with top young athletes from across the south of England in Chelmsford on Saturday. Having qualified for the school's cross-country regional championships, Robin Fosser claimed a, a superb third place in the junior girls' event with Maisie Kent, 33rd. Robin's place also counted towards Hampshire winning the silver team medal. And a sports item. Ventnor have taken important steps to stabilise the cricket club following their disastrous 2019 season by signing a talented player coach from Barbados. Anthony Allen may not be a household name, but the 26-year-old who played for Paynton, runner-up in the Devon Cricket League Premier last season, has chalked up more than 30 first-class matches for Barbados, and has played for the West Indies under-19s. In West Indian cricket, Allen hit a career best of 186 against Trinidad and Tobago. A qualified ECB levels to coach, Allen will play a leading role at senior and junior levels at the club this coming season. Last season was a nightmare for Ventnor, who lost their Southern League Premier Division 1 status after losing all 17 league matches. Graham Burnett, who helped broker the deal to bring the left-hander into the fold, was delighted by the appointment. We wanted an all-rounder. Anthony is a top-order batsman and an off-spin medium pace bowler, but is also a level 2 coach which we needed at Ventnor, he said. And Lacey wins Euro belt for full title set. A talented young island kickboxer, Lacey Masterton Davis, has added another top title to her burgeoning collection, making it a full set of world and European awards. The 11-year-old, who attends Ride Academy, won the K1 class for girls aged 10 to 12 years, under 50 kilograms, in the IKF European Open Championships held at East Sussex College, Hastings. The ride youngster beat a Dutch girl, Zara Durik, in the final over three rounds, making it her third belt alongside Moore Thai gold, silver and bronze medals in the K1 category. Lacey said she was delighted with her latest success and in making it a full set of international titles in K1 and is hungry for more this year. And another something rather different. Message, messages of Support at Culver Cliff Messages of Support and the phone number for the Samaritans have been left at Culver Cliff. Pebbles, painted with inspirational messages, have been dotted along the cliff edge and posts have been tagged on the fence with the phone number for those needing to speak to someone. 116-123 Alan Doe, Bembridge RNLI's Community and Coastal Safety Officer, posted on Facebook, I was walking along the top of Culver Cliff over the new year and was delighted to find lots of delicately painted pebbles on the fence posts, each with an upbeat message 
and a number to phone if you're not feeling great. A big thank you to whoever has done this. It's an excellent intervention. Isle of Wight coroner Carolyn Sumare said at a recent inquest she would welcome more signs at Culver promoting the Samaritans to those who need support. Braiding Pub closes. Braiding Pub, the King's Well, will close on Sunday. On its Facebook page, owners Matt and Tom said it was with great sadness the pub was closing after five years and they tried to make it work. Thanking their staff and customers, the post said, we have enjoyed every minute and have met some lovely people and made great friends. Who knows what the future will hold, but we will hopefully see you all again soon. £100,000 for planning. The Isle of Wight Council has allocated £100,000 to the planning department in a bid to reduce the housing target. The cash will be used to carry out work and gather evidence to draw up a case that can be presented to the government to show the target of almost 10,000 homes over 15 years is too high. The funding was approved by the Cabinet. And this is a trial set for a knife attack. Three people appeared at the Isle of Wight Crown Court on Monday, charged with aggravated burglary and wounded with a tent, after armed police were called in a knife attack at a ride flat. The defendants, Timothy Brown, 39, and Louise April Spence, 29, both of no fixed address, and Graham Smith, 40, of Ventnor, pleaded not guilty. They were charged with stealing cash and drugs to the value of £1,500 from the East Hill Road flat on December the 27th and using a knife to wound the occupant with intent to cause him grievous harm. The case was adjourned to June the 15th for a trial. Along the same lines, drug driver had taken cocaine. Police stopped a car after noticing the passenger was not wearing a seatbelt, then arrested the driver for failing a drug test. Alf Carey, 20, of Weston Road, Totland, pleaded guilty to drug driving when he appeared at the Isle of Wight Magistrates Court. The court heard police stopped Carey's car at Dodna Lane, Newport, on August 25th, and a subsequent test revealed that he had taken cocaine. Prosecutor Vivian Ducey said, one passenger wasn't wearing a seatbelt, so, as is routine, the police performed a roadside test on the driver, which turned up a positive test for cocaine. Liz Miller, defending, said, he had taken it the night before and thought it would have left his system. It's important to note he was not stopped for the quality of his driving. He tells me that since this incident, he hasn't touched drugs. He is incredibly sorry and realises he's going to have to get up a lot earlier to get to work. Carey was banned from driving for 12 months. He was fined £240 and ordered to pay court costs of £85 and a surcharge of £32. Lion Kings moved into new home. Two rescued lion brothers have a new Desres on the Isle of Wight. Complete with a heated sleeping area, the new accommodation also features specially reinforced full height windows which allow the public close up views when Kumba and Vigo are not enjoying the outdoors. Vigo and Kumba were brought to the Sandown Zoo last year after being saved from a Spanish circus where they spent most of their lives cooped up together in a lorry trailer. When they were young, they were neutralised 
beaten and their claws were cruelly and painfully removed. The zoo's animal manager, Mark Fox, says, After such an unfortunate start to their lives, we're so pleased to be able to provide Kumba and Vigo with really modern and comfortable new accommodation. They will now have a stimulating environment which caters for all of their needs while offering visitors to the zoo an awe-inspiring, immersive experience when they come nose to nose with those two gentle giants. The new house offers fantastic views of the brothers when they are relaxing in their indoor quarters or taking small chunks of meat from their new on-show feeding hatches. Outside, they will be able to spend time exploring the new landscaping or sitting up on their raised platform to survey their territory. Keepers will offer a variety of different enrichment methods to help keep them stimulated, ensuring they have a really good quality of life. Since the boys arrived, the Wild Heart Trust, which operates the zoo, has been working on fundraising and sponsorship to develop the new supersized accommodation, especially to accommodate the lion's extraordinary size. The zoo has encouraged people to come and welcome the lions in their new house, as every visit raises fund for their own ongoing care. It costs around £12,000 to look after each lion for one year. Construction company Wilmot Dixon generously donated skills and labour for the design and build of the new house. Appeal to feed freshwater swans. An appeal has been launched to feed an unprecedented number of swans nesting at the causeway freshwater. Around 24 swans are now living on the river and there are fears that some may starve without more people helping to feed them. Jenny and Roger Roger Crates of Copse Lane have looked after the swans there for the last 12 years. Jenny said, we normally have the two older swans, who we call mum and dad, with their signets. But this year, they've been joined by so many others. The numbers are absolutely unprecedented. We normally feed them swan pellets, which can be bought online or from Freshwater Pet Store, and our farmhouse, and also farmhouse wholemeal brown bread from the co-op. Unfortunately, with these numbers on the river, it's costing us a lot of money, so we need help to keep them alive and healthy. So with that, we say goodbye to you and hope you have a good weekend. Weather doesn't sound too good tomorrow, but enjoy yourselves from Imelda. And uh, goodbye from Sonara. Message read on behalf of Miriam Tong, CEO. Dear all, Stakeholder Consultation Meeting, 11th of February 2020, 10am to 1pm. Central Newport Venue to be confirmed. Side for White is inviting visually impaired members, volunteers and stakeholders to a consultation meeting that will inform the future direction of our charity. The meeting will include discussions on our mission and options for future programmes and operations. Site for White trustees are meeting in January to narrow down what we think is feasible for us to achieve and we will share these reflections and options at the consultation meeting. If you would like to attend on the 11th of February please let us know by email, letter or telephone. Further details of the meeting will then be sent out accordingly, including any assistance with transport for visually impaired members we are able to offer, which may be limited to providing a sighted guide escort service from Newport bus station to the meeting venue. If you are unable to attend, you will still be able to input into these important discussions. 
If you would like to make any suggestions or observations for consideration whether or not you are able or hope to attend in person, please let us have your reflections by the 4th of February at the latest. Again, by email, letter or telephone. Please ensure emails are sent to inquiries at iwsb.org.uk. Please mark emails or letters with consultation meeting in the title so we can readily identify them. We will subsequently share recommendations from the consultation meeting via our weekly talking news service and our quarterly newsletter. Yours sincerely, Miriam Tong, CEO. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Good evening. Tonight, the BBC's Red Button Tech Service gets a stay of execution after blind people protest. But how long can it survive? And it's a definite green light for young blind people wanting to lend a hand in developing countries. A lot of them work in health. You don't have to be a doctor. They work in education. You don't have to be a teacher. They work in livelihoods. You don't have to be some sort of entrepreneurial guru. You just have to be yourself. We'll also hear tonight where to go for help if you're worried about what your visually impaired children are getting up to online. But first, the BBC's Red Button Tech Service was due to be phased out at the end of last week. It's been around for 20 years as a successor to CFAX and described as vital by some blind people as a source of news, sport, weather etc. when going online might be a problem. Last year, the BBC said usage of the red button had slumped as more and more of us accessed content via smartphones or tablets rather than through the TV. But there's been a reprieve from a shutdown after protests culminating in a petition organised by the National Federation of the Blind. That petition was uh, handed in to the BBC and Downing Street a few days ago. It was organised by Victor Jackson got the backing of more than 160 charities and organisations representing a broad range of disabled and older people. From his home in Leeds, Victor demonstrated to me how he uses the red button service. I want to look at the sports results for Leeds. I press the red button and it shows at the top 102 for all the different types of things that I want. And I'm going to press 300 So then I go to the OK button and it will bring up all the different sports, football, cricket, all the way down to rugby and then the lesser sports. I'm going to press the football one. Press down to it get direct. It's on tables now. It's on Premier now, so I want to go down one. Because you're a Leeds United fan, yeah? yeah, Yes. (laughs) All I'm interested in is Leeds United, who's above... And who's below? So why is the red button particularly good for you? It's because I personally, at 77, do not want to use a computer. People on benefits, first of all, can't afford computers. They're expensive. You have to have a service provider, which you have to pay for. At my age, I I can do without all the scams that come through. And what do you use it for, mainly? Ordinary news in Great Britain, you have to buy a newspaper otherwise, and I can't read a newspaper. As I said, the sports results occasionally. I use it for the politics. I use it for the science. I use it for the business news. So when the BBC says to you, yes, but the numbers of people using this is going down very fast and it's still expensive to run, what do you say? This is an essential service for blind and deaf people in particular who have to use sign language just to watch the ordinary news and every day they have a sign language girl or man but this is not adequate enough for them so they have to be able to read it on the screen. This is a vital thing for a lot of people. I know lots of sighted people who use it as well. That was Victor Jackson speaking to me from his home in Leeds. Well, the former chair of the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee is Conservative MP Damien Collins. 
He wrote to the BBC's Director-General, Tony Hall, last week, calling for a pause in the closing down of the Red Button Tech Service. What I want to see is the equalities assessment that the BBC has done to understand what the impact of losing this service would be. Because the charities and campaigners I spoke to said they've never seen it. Indeed, I've asked to see that as well as part of my letter to the Director General, Tony Hall. And I want to take up his offer to meet with him, with campaigners, to look at that assessment, to discuss what the impact would be. Then we'll be in a position to know just how many people this is going to affect, people who at the moment do not access the BBC through any of the service. What's your suspicion? My suspicion is that it's not been done. Um, And that's why the BBC's agreed to pause this, because they need to do a proper detailed assessment of what the impact would be. And I think what the impact will show is there are still a very significant minority of people that that rely on that service. And without it, they wouldn't be able to access the BBC. Last week, the BBC announced 450 job losses as part of £80 million of savings. And we know of other problems that the BBC is facing as far as finance is concerned. When push comes to shove... BBC's got to work out what services to fund and what has to go. And that problem isn't going to go away, is it? But I, I don't think what they should be doing is making decisions, which means some people, rather than just losing some services that they like, effectively lose access to the BBC altogether. There are some people that rely on the red button function to be able to access what the BBC provides. And I think we need to take that into account and, and accept that there will be a period of time where there are still a very large number of people in this country that don't use the internet and rely on services like the red button to have access to the BBC. If the BBC gets three and a half billion pounds a year from the licence fee. I'm sure it can find enough money to run the red button. You aren't any longer chair of the Culture Sport Media Committee. Are you going to stay with this issue? Absolutely. I mean, I wrote to Tony Hall uh, only a short time ago. Um, He's offered that meeting to me. He's subsequently written to me since the election for the chair of the committee saying that uh, he wants to remain engaged on the issues that I'm engaging with the BBC on. And that's certainly my intention. So what would a better resolution be? Well, I think what we need to do is understand exactly how many people access the service at the moment, work with the charities uh, that have raised this issue to see how can proper mitigation be put in place. And if it can't, then I think we should ensure that some of these vital services are maintained. Well, we did ask the BBC about that equality assessment that Damien Collins mentioned there. We weren't offered a specific answer, but the Director General, Lord Hall, has said that he's heard the concern that the closure of the red button text service could negatively affect elderly people and people with disabilities. He says, these are issues which I feel deserve to be explored in more depth, so we've decided to suspend its closure. A fresh decision will be made in the spring. Now, when it comes to the youngest generation of visually impaired people, knowing their way around the web often comes naturally. They've been brought up with it. But that also comes with its own dangers. Look UK speaks for blind and partially sighted children and their families. It's planning a series of online seminars early next week for parents and youngsters about how to stay safe on the internet. Charlotte Carson is putting these together. On Tuesday, which is actually Safer Internet Day, we're running two separate workshops online, one aimed at young visually impaired people aged 13 to 15, and that's how to be safe and savvy online. And the second one is aimed at parents, and that's parents of visually impaired children and young people, encouraging and empowering them to keep their children safe online. Just to focus on one group this isn't for, but you are yourself a visually impaired mum of two young sighted daughters. How do you make sure they're safe when they surf? Well, it's a bit of a minefield and actually this has become a real issue for me recently because my eldest daughter is nine and my youngest daughter is seven and in the early years of their lives I tried to keep them away from technology but inevitably they want it and we actually bought my eldest daughter a laptop for Christmas but I'm filled with fear. Where is she going? What is she doing? When she's on lots of games, it's completely silent. Mm. When she's on YouTube, I can hear what people are talking about, but then it goes quiet and what's she looking at? So are you going to have to go on a seminar yourself? 
I am. I need to learn, definitely. And I've got no assistive technology on that laptop, so I can't go and spy on her and see what she's been up to. It's got me thinking, and it's got me thinking about how I parent. Do I want to spy on her and restrict and and kind of be a bit of an internet police? Or do I want to find out what my daughter thinks? Do I want to learn about what she's looking at? And I think that's what we are trying to do in these workshops. So we're working with an organisation called Wise Kids, and Sangeet Buller um, of that is going to be leading the workshop and she's going to be helping us talk about all of these issues. And of course, as you say, the focus of these seminars online is actually on helping and protecting visually impaired children rather than blind parents like you. So what do you think the main danger for them is? All of those risks actually that affect every single child affect blind and visually impaired children but there are I think a few added challenges that we need to talk about and that's about the fact that visually impaired children are exploring the world online now in a way that actually in many forms of life they can be excluded from so for instance social opportunities if young visually impaired people aren't going out and accessing a life offline through going to local brownies or sports or all the other things that children do and they are online a lot which they are because the you know online has opened up the world for visually impaired people then these are things that parents need to be talking about with their children you know where are they going who are they talking to and what are they doing that's charlotte carson of look uk And in a few weeks, we'll hopefully be hearing from some of those who took part in these so-called webinars. You can find out more details on Look UK's website. There's a link to that on this programme's page on our own In Touch site. Thanks for your responses to last week's programme. We do read every email you send us. Mark Coleman, for example, he's from Spennymore in County Durham, heard our interview with Melissa Reid, the champion surfer who's visually impaired. Mark says, I tried surfing myself in Cornwall just over a year ago. The thing which really appeals is that it's pretty much indistinguishable from how a sighted person would do it. All I needed was someone in the water telling me when to dodge or catch a wave. No special equipment, no bells attached to the waves. It's a sport I intend to continue for exactly that reason. Now, one of my own disappointments when I was trying to sort out what to do with my life was being turned down by VSO, or Voluntary Service Overseas. In a nutshell, their message to me was uh, VSO is designed to offer help to people in developing countries rather than solve your problems. Well, that was back in the late 60s, and it seems times have rather changed. The government now funds something called International Citizen Service, or ICS. This offers three-month placements abroad and 12% of their volunteers have disabilities and they're keen to encourage visually impaired people to come forward. People like Mohamed Katri from Leicester. Back in 2015 he found himself in Zambia offering advice to businesses. I asked Mohamed if a trip like that was something he ever anticipated when he first lost his sight as a teenager. When you lose your sight With it, you lose a lot of your dreams. And one of those dreams is traveling. My friends taking gap years and going all over the world and doing all these weird and wonderful things and thinking that I'd be able to work and contribute to the world and actually go and live in another country whilst being blind is a real far-fetched dream. So how did you find out about uh, the International Citizen Service Scheme, uh, which was how you got into this? I actually got invited to one of the focus groups that they were running in London. And that focus group was getting different people from different backgrounds together to ask them if they heard of ICS, if they heard of VSO, if they heard of the program. And I was sitting there thinking, what on earth is this? Like, why would people send people away around the world for free? It doesn't make any sense. My curiosity kicked in. I got home. I Googled it realised it was a government-funded programme, and then I held on to that application for six months. I was actually scared and quite fearful of being rejected and not sure if I'd be able to do it. And a day came when I was just like, I might as well apply. Looked at the application form, it took me 20 minutes. It takes a lot of courage to put yourself 
forward for something like that. And, and I think it's very natural to have fears when you are blind, when you have a disability, when you have any sort of condition which debilitates you. Just tell me what your first impressions were when you got to Zambia. It was just excitement because it's something I did not think I'd be able to do. I was spending time with people I didn't know, but was very, very, very quickly getting to know. And I didn't have my dog with me. I wasn't using my cane there because it isn't really effective using it in a place you don't know. And just relying on people to guide me. And people are very, very happy to support and assist. In the beginning, it's a real gentle introduction to the country, the culture, and also the family that's going to be looking after you and who you're going to be staying with. The ICS program isn't your typical volunteering stint going abroad where you're going to be saving the sea turtles from extinction or building wells or helping construct a new school. No, no, no. It's all about human capital. It's all about sharing our knowledge and expertise with local people there so that we can have an impact going forward. So what were you doing? What was your expertise? What did you end up doing? I was working with local businesses to upskill them and to give them some of the Western nows or just a different way of thinking to try and help them develop their businesses and improve their profitability prospects going forward and their livelihood prospects in the long run. I'm not a business expert, but that doesn't matter. And it's the same with a lot of the ICS projects. A lot of them work in health. You don't have to be a doctor. They work in education. You don't have to be a teacher. They work in livelihoods. You don't have to be some sort of entrepreneurial guru. You just have to be yourself and use your skills. And the program is tailored to help you utilize what you do have. What was their attitude to you? You know, that one of the fears is that uh, somebody comes in from Britain, you know, telling them what to do. I just wonder how they reacted to you. So reacting to me and reacting to others, I think, are two different questions. Reacting to me, I think there was just a sense of astonishment that someone blind can come and do this. Someone with a disability has the guts and the strength to jump on a plane and go and work in another country for three months when in reality a lot of people with disabilities in countries like Zambia, India, Pakistan, etc. don't have the support from their networks, from schooling, in health to build the confidence to go and ever do those sort of things. When you talk about others, I had a partnership with my local counterpart who was a Zambian male called Museba. So when you're working in communities, when you're working within businesses, when you're working with different leaders, you have someone that's local there as well. So it really does help break down those barriers and it doesn't seem like you're just jumping in from England, coming with all your money and just trying to solve their problems because that isn't the case and that's not something we want to portray either. Now, you now support volunteers ahead of their trips abroad. What are the practical lessons perhaps you learn from from your own travels that you pass on to them? The most important thing is just to enjoy yourself and to be yourself. This is a fantastic opportunity for you to develop, for you to go away for three months, but actually grow three years when you come back. Were you actually working specifically with other people with disabilities or did you just you know, work with all kinds of people? No, I was the only person with a disability on my group. So I was working with people who are fully able, fully bodied, and even the businesses were all the same. My desire is to help people with disabilities now. I jump on the opportunity to go and work with people who are blind, work with people who have difficulties, because that's my passion and my desire. But no, we don't want to shoehorn you into something just because you're blind. That's like saying, oh, I'm black, so you go help black people. You're white, so you go help white people. That just isn't the way the world works. When you were uh, very newly blind, what did you think were the kind of limitations you were facing? Absolutely everything. It's hard to just get yourself out of bed and know that you can accomplish day-to-day activities, let alone go and travel or have a family or get a job, go to university, complete education, even getting around and walking. So it really is all-encompassing when you do lose your sight and it does take a lot of strength and a lot of courage and support from people around you to make you realize that actually everything is possible it might take you longer and it will be harder work but it is ultimately possible that's mohammed katri i should add that international citizen service is available for 18 to 35 year olds we put up a link to the vso's website on the, this program's page on our own website and if you do go to bbc.co.uk forward slash in touch 
you can also download tonight's programme. You can email in touch bbc.co.uk with your views. If you prefer the phone, you can leave messages with your comments on 0161 836 1338. For now, from me, Peter White, producer Mike Young and the team, goodbye. This is the scaffolding news for Friday the 7th of February 2020. In the West White area, scaffolding. Tanners, 10 High Street, Yarmouth. Skips at 1 Guy's Cottage, Blackbridge Road, Freshwater. And at Tanners, 10 High Street, Yarmouth. There's a cherry picker at Afton Road Junction with Military Road, Freshwater. Cows and East Cows. Scaffolding. Cameos at 16 Bath Road, Cows. The Earning Collection Shop, 120 High Street, Cows. 116B High Street, Cows. 21 York Street, Cows. 24 Terminus Road, Cows. And 24 Castle Street, East Cows. Ventnor Scaffolding. The Old Nursery, Atherfield Green, Atherfield. Highlands, Bellevue Road, Ventnor. Old Town Hall, 1 to 12 Albert Street, Ventnor. Yeoman's Cottage, High Street, Godshill. Skips, 16 South Street, Ventnor. Ride, Seaview and Bembridge. Hoardings, Car Park, Brooks Close, Bembridge. 6 to 7 High Street, Ride. Scaffolding. Flats 31 to 36 Mary Mead Close Ride. 9 Winton Street Ride. Coburg's Union Street Ride. Rockcliffe, Circular Road, Seaview. Skips. Boutique, 20 Cross Street Ride. Dover Cottage, Ride Road, Ride. 3 Westwood Road, Ride. And in Newport, scaffolding, Phones for You, 50 High Street, Newport, and 146 High Street, Newport. In Sandown, hoardings at the Premier Inn, 1 to 9 Esplanade, Sandown, 89 Downsview Road, Sandown. And Sir Crane at the Premier Inn, 1 to 9 Esplanade, Sandown. And Skips at 83 The Broadway, Sandown. <laughs>